thank you all for taking your lunch hour to spend some time with me here today. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on about 100 years worth of history here. So I would encourage you all to ask questions whenever they come to you, um, because I don't want you to forget once we move on to something different what you wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm very happy to be casual about this. You know, even, even though we're a large, in a large room, it's a relatively intimate group. So any questions you have, I'm happy to take um, at any moment in time. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to begin with a, a short discussion of what economic rights are. So I think it's a, a term we throw around a lot, but giving actually a definition of what that fundamentally means, I think, will be valuable for understanding um, the history of how women's economic and political experiences have changed over time and kind of why that's significant. Um, so then I'll talk about those changes. And then at the end, we'll have some time to discuss a little bit what we can learn from that for women's experiences around the world today. OK, so what are economic rights? Um, economic rights are the rights to make decisions for yourself about how you're going to use your time and your resources. And your resources, including your mental and physical energies. So not just physical goods, although things like land, money, um, and other types of physical resources do count for that, and they do matter, of course. Um, but it's also about how you're going to spend the hours of your day and where you're going to direct your, your energy. Um, and the fundamental question that underlies all of this is who is planning your life? So if you're not the one who's making decisions about how you're going to use your time and your talents and the resources that are at your disposal, then that means that somebody else is. Somebody is making the determination. Is that you or is it someone else? And if you're not the one planning your life, that not only puts us in a really weird place from the perspective of liberalism, but it also puts us in a bad place from the perspective of just the advancement of a society. Because if people are not at will to experiment and to choose how they want to participate in the economy and in the world, then we all miss out on their contributions and what they could be bringing to the table for us. So this issue of do women have these basic economic rights that allow you to determine where you're going to live, what kind of work you're going to do, and how you're going to spend your days, I view this as both a crucial uh, issue for both economic development and for human rights. So economic rights are a human rights issue. Um, all right. So do women have economic rights? I should clarify a little bit. I'm mostly going to be talking here about history. And if we look at the long scope of history, most societies across the globe have some sort of tradition of at least within a family and within a marriage, delegating some subset of that woman's economic decisions to her husband or to the patriarch of the family. So that's what we call patriarchy. If you have some sort of set of political institutions in which men are allowed to make these decisions about the dispensation of property and the usage of time on behalf of the women in their lives, that is a patriarchal society. And elements of that have existed um, kind of around the world, really at least since the birth of the modern nation. It gets complicated if we're talking about even earlier societies. You see a lot more variety in terms of some societies leaning more matriarchal, some societies being more egalitarian. Um, but once we get large-scale militaries and really large-scale nations, it's pretty common for almost all of them to have some element of this ownership, if not outright ownership of women by men, then ownership of some subset of their decisions and resources. And this continues up into um, British history, so moving into kind of the modern world. So if you look at um, Britain at the time of the American founding, which is where the United States is getting most of our legal and political institutional ideas from, then at that time, this is considered to be the relation between men and women within a marriage. So this gentleman here with the lovely locks is Sir William Blackstone. 
um, a preeminent legal scholar. This would have been the, mo the commentaries upon the laws of England would have been the most common law book that a, a lawyer or a judge practicing in the early days of the United States would have had access to. And what he's describing here is the system known as coverture. So it's this idea that there must be a single head of household, and it is the husband under whose wing protection and cover everything within that household is being performed. Um, so it's sometimes said that married women have functionally the same status as uh, children and as people who are considered not to be in control of their mental faculties. So at the time, they used the word idiots. So it's idiots, children, and married women all get the same kind of legal status here. Um, you're literally, from the perspective of the law, not your own person anymore. What does this mean in practical terms? So if you are not an independent entity and the law is not recognizing you as such, what this means is that you can't independently own land, homes, businesses. Um, that would include um, anything that requires a substantial investment or would require a contract to be able to negotiate because women can't sign contracts without their husband's permission. And if they do, he can revoke it after the fact if he decides he didn't like the terms. So that's not really a recipe for being able to credibly commit to some sort of business arrangement with someone. Um, they can't keep any wages that they earn during the time of their marriage. I already mentioned they can't stand for themselves in court. Um, they have to find, if not a father or a husband to stand for them, then someone called a male next friend, some sort of male trustee who can be recognized by the court. I see somebody, somebody's got a next friend over there that they're recognizing who can advocate for them. No, it's okay, I'm not, just wanted to, to make a joke, I'm not calling you out. <laughs> um, they can't write a will. So this is really critically important because if one of the primary motivators in your life is to be able to provide for your children and to be able to build a family and you can't participate in that process of deciding how those resources are going to be passed along, then you're kind of depriving women of something that could be a really substantial motivating force for a life. You're taking that choice set of how you want to invest your energy and your time and kind of pulling it away. This gets further complicated. Um, I'll just say worse. This gets, this gets worse um, because you can't get divorced. So if you wind up in this situation where you're married to someone who is making decisions for you, and if you're allowed to make the decision for yourself, you can come around and revoke it after the fact. And that guy is not acting with your interests in mind. So it's possible you can um, have this kind of perfect partnership where your husband really is doing everything he can to take account of your interests. Just because a person is not choosing to exercise their right to oppress you does not mean that you're not still in a situation where you're being subjugated to the will of another because there's always that threat. Um, and if you're in this situation, that threat is made even stronger by the fact that you can't leave. So there is... Sometimes you hear that in history it was okay for men to beat their wives. That's not really true. There probably was a little bit more lenience for physical violence than there is today, um, but it wasn't really okay to physically harm or, or your wife in a serious way. Um, but you could confine her to make her stay. And certainly the law is extremely unwilling to grant you a formal divorce. So if you're in a legal situation where you don't formally have any property rights, the court is not going to give you a divorce. Literally, you have to go to court and prove that you have been abandoned for at least seven years to get a divorce in most states in 1800 in the United States. Seven years. Seven years without formal property rights, without access to the court system. Um, and, you know, People in individual situations find the next best solution and clever ways to work around this, um, but it's still a significant limitation. Um, so this right to be able to exit not being there is very problematic because in all situations, your ability to exit is one of your greatest protections. It's what, you know, your boss can't be too much of a jerk to you because you can leave the job. 
um, you know, in situations where you have a very oppressive government, like in North Korea, one of the ways they can get away with that is how difficult it is for the people to leave that country. So this kind of right to exit is actually a critical both uh, economic rights issue because it's giving you that bargaining power and also, again, just human rights issue that's preserving your, your safety. Um, of course, this changes. So one of the things that I think is remarkable about how common patriarchal institutions are in global history is that we have a 100-year period in the United States where within the formal law, they all but disappear. So I'm not saying they disappear out of the culture. Or I'm, not, I'm not trying to enter that debate right now. But just from the perspective of formal law, we are no longer permitted to make any distinctions by gender. You are not allowed to have these, I mean, of course anybody can allow themselves to be bullied or, or maybe not treated well by a partner. But at least under the law, that kind of behavior is never going to be protected. You do have the right to exit. You do have the right to keep property separately within a marriage. If your husband goes and racks up grant gambling debts in Vegas and you have separate bank accounts, the court can't come after those separate bank accounts and make you pay your husband's debts anymore like used to be the case. Um, so we have this remarkable change where we go from kind of a world dominated by these patriarchal institutions to the relatively gender egalitarian uh, society um, that we find in the 20th and 21st century United States where women are working, where women are becoming educated um, and making these economic decisions for themselves. So most family law is state law. So this changes um, over the course of the 19th century. So some states reform much earlier than other states. I don't know how well the shading is coming across on the monitor. Um, but the darker the state is colored in, the earlier in the 19th century this state protected married women's right to own separate property and to keep their earnings separately. Um, so New York um, and a couple other states here in the, in the center of the Northeast, they begin to reform these laws in the 1840s. Um, Florida, arguably, not until after 1820. Poor Florida, they just <laughs> get so little credit. Um, so behind. Okay. Um, and then we have also in the Northeast here, um, many of these states are reforming kind of through the 1850s, 1860s, and then we're starting to see this legal change kind of spread across the center of the country um, with immigration and movement to that part of the United States and settlement. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the, how the, the politics and the, the laws impacted women's ability to be independent economic decision makers on the frontier a little bit later. Um, but that's the basic overview. So we have this change that is um, literally globally unprecedented, and it happens in this blink of an eye from a historical perspective in the United States, but some places get it right a lot sooner than others. I know that's a normative thing to say, but I'm, I'm comfortable going ahead and saying women having equal rights is a good thing. Um, so I don't think I have to hopefully turn in my economist card for that one. Um, but so this creates the opportunity then to take a look at what were the conditions, what were the economic conditions, the political conditions in these states that reformed earlier, and what about them you know, might give us some clues as to when a society is likely to turn in this more egalitarian and inclusive direction. Okay, so the big question, um, which I so cleverly put in a big font to illustrate its bigness, um, is how did so much change? How did this change? And I'm going to go through uh, three um, arguments, hypotheses, however you want to think about them, um, that I think stand out from the study of women in 19th century history and really bring some illumination to this idea of how a political and social structure might wind up going from a situation in which they're currently um, creating a minority underclass to no longer doing that. 
And the problem of how a minority can gain rights is kind of a deeply problematic one, even in democracy. Because if you're living in a status quo where you're not currently being represented, where you don't have the right to vote, where you can't hold a political office, where you're deprived of economic resources, where you're often deprived of access to the best educational and professional opportunities, how are you going to get the power to demand change? So it's kind of this really um, deep problem of how a group who currently is under-resourced can shock the status quo in a way that's going to motivate that more powerful group within the society to want to be more cognizant of them. Um, and the first big change I argue that happened in 19th century history is that there were new opportunities to work outside the home that resulted in a change in the way people were thinking about women and women's capacity to work. Um, so I mean that from both um, a very like direct economic production standpoint, we're now thinking of women as economic producers who are capable of generating more than we thought if we include them in the economy. And I also mean that from kind of an ideological and cultural standpoint. If you have this idea that women are not really well suited to be able to take advantage of these kinds of business opportunities or political leadership, social leadership, and then all of a sudden you see them doing it, that that's a little bit of a shock to the worldview that's going to be hard to ignore when you actually see this group that you thought wasn't capable of something doing it. It's hard to hold on to your false view. Not impossible, but it makes it harder to hold on to a false view. Okay. Um, so the first major industry in, United, in global history um, was the textile industry. So the first um, major factories are established in Britain, um, but it's not, uh, it's not too long after they're established that they begin to be built in the United States also. Um, I love this part of United States history. You know, we have this vision, this imagination of ourselves as inventors, entrepreneurs, just on an unprecedented scale, nobody can catch up. Um, but we actually stole <laughs> all this technology from Britain. Um, so they created it first, we stole it. I'm not saying we haven't done some great things since then, credit where credit is due. Um, but literally, uh, you know, aspiring businessmen in the United States are engaging in industrial espionage, either themselves or they're hiring people to, to go and to kind of like sneakily like tour the factory and like draw up a little blueprint and come over. And Britain is trying to lock that down. They're trying not to let any of that machinery, any of those workers who had those skills leave the country. So if you're a skilled, skilled tradesman in Britain in the late 18th century, and you want to try to immigrate to America for higher pay, you have to often not bring your tools with you. Because if they catch you with the tools of your craft, you can be imprisoned um, or very heavily fined, and you certainly will not be allowed to exit the country. Um, so they're really trying very hard to maintain economic domination with, kind of, with a protectionist view. Um, but anyway. So this is what the textile industry looks like before the Industrial Revolution. It's taking place in cottage industries, which means a small group of women, one, two, half dozen, um, working out of one of their homes. And they're taking the raw material like wool, and they're using um, early wooden tools like this little Rumpelstiltskin type spinning wheel here um, to take that wool and transform it through all the processes that are required to turn that into fabric. It's incredibly labor intensive. This is what the textile industry looks like after the Industrial Revolution. And this is technology that continues to improve from the time of its development, I mean really until today, um, but it's improving at a rapid rate throughout the 19th century. But even the very first version of these new large-scale 
water or steam powered looms. Even the very first rudimentary versions allow women to produce four times as much cloth in an hour as they could when they were working in cottage industry. So you have an instant quadrupling of the marginal product of women's labor. Imagine that. Imagine waking up tomorrow and finding out your paycheck had quadrupled. What would you even do with yourself? Don't, don't say, <laughs> what now, yeah. Maybe don't say exactly what you would do, especially if your supervisor is currently in the room. Um, but this is a moment, a change in time, that gives women so much more power to bargain than they ever had before. Because now you have an industry that is, you know, th this is like being on the front end of dot com in the late 80s or early 90s. Like this is the hot industry. This is where the future millionaires, billionaires, economic leaders are going to be coming from is who can kind of get ahead in this textile world. And the people in society who, um, well, they are cheaper because at this time, this is women's first opportunity to shift out of household production and into kind of production in the wage labor force. Um, so women do have fewer competing opportunities, so it is possible to hire them still at lower wages than men, um, about a third. So if you think the gender wage gap is bad now, it would have been about 35 or 40 cents on the dollar at this time. Um, but this, in addition to being cheaper, women possess already the skill set of weaving. They're already the ones who have been producing all of the textiles for hundreds of years, um, maybe longer. Um, and they were doing that in this kind of domestic production role. So one kind of sidebar that I do want to make clear is that women have always been active economic participants. So it's not like this was the first time women worked. Women were always <laughs> working incredibly hard, but they were producing primarily for uh, domestic consumption or for like small scale trade in a local market. So they were producing things like textiles, soaps, candles, canned goods, all these kind of basic household necessities. Women were the manufacturing industry. Um, so it's not until kind of later um, that we kind of forget that and start to think of maybe more a male-dominated industry. But nevertheless, this is quadrupling their marginal productivity. In addition to quadrupling their marginal productivity, it's giving them an opportunity to move away from the farm. So the United States is 95% farmers at this time. It's like all farmers and then a few wealthy farmers who are also lawyers, like Thomas Jefferson. So like it's, everybody is doing um, hard agricultural labor. Um, and one of the things that that means is that you're living in a rural area. So farming in the 18, you know, 1800s would not have had the crop yields it has today. So even compared to modern farming, you'd have needed a lot more land to get kind of the same production. So you're living in this area where you're just not going to encounter that many other people in your life. And now all of a sudden you get the opportunity to not only quadruple your wages, but you get to move to this new thing known as the American city. There aren't that many of them yet if you're talking about 1815, 1820. This is the very start of urbanization. So it's the start of industrialization. It goes hand in hand with the start of the move to the city that we're maybe seeing kind of come to what I hope is an apex um, now at this particular moment in time. I don't know how many more people we can cram up, um, vertically in our cities right now. Um, but this is the start of this process. And one of the things, you know, what's the reason why you guys are in a city now? Why didn't you stay home? Probably many of you, I imagine, came from much less populated areas. Who came from a less populated area? Why did you move? Work, work, but what else? Do you wanna move back home? Who wants to move back home? I go back home to where I grew up. I love it. I love my family, I love my hometown, 
but it's like one street. Like the hot place to go is Kohl's. You know, there's like nothing. So you move to the city, and not only are you earning so much more, you're also meeting people. You're getting access to um, cultural, social opportunities that had not really been in the, the realm of opportunity before. Um, so this is, this cover here is the cover of a magazine uh, edited, written, and produced by and for the women who worked in the Lowell Mills. So which was one of the kind of big, maybe the biggest I, um, kind of key players in this industry. So in addition to coming to do this work, they're getting this educational opportunity. So the owners of the mill are providing classes. They're providing opportunity to do this kind of um, creative work. Some of these women go on to become writers, um, like Harriet Robinson, um, from whom this quote comes from. And she describes this phenomena of stories being told all over the country about the new factory town and the high wages that were offered to all classes of people and gave new life to lonely and, and, and dependent women. I, I want to say that again because if you run it together, it sounds like they're already independent. But it, and gave new life to lonely and dependent women in distant towns and farmhouses. Um, so one of the... Um, kind of common offerings to this magazine is that these women will write like fictionalizations of their own story or of stories of other women that they worked with. So one woman who calls herself Sarah in this article she writes for the Lowell Offering talks about how before this she was from, you know, a low income family like almost every family would have been in the United States at this time. So the only option available to her was domestic work. So she's working in somebody else's household rather than her own, but she's still doing that kind of domestic labor. And Miss, she's doing this labor for a woman named Mrs. J, who at least in the fictionalization is just an absolute monster. Beats her, yells at her when the coffee is not ready before you know, the first other person in the household wakes up. She just describes this life of drudgery and of fear that she feels like she can't get away from. So for her, the opportunity to go work in a factory is like this shining light. It's this opportunity to actually get out of this situation that she feels so trapped in. And I think it's easy in the modern day to look back on these early industrial positions and focus primarily on how terrible they seemed. And I don't want to sugarcoat that because it's incredibly difficult labor. These are young people, 16 to 24 year olds most of the time, working 12 hours a day. They are away from home. I mean, this is, let, let's just say workplace safety standards in 1800 were not the same as they are in 2018. And that's true of any industry. So that was true on the farm as well. I did a lot of reading old United States and British newspapers for this project and for other research that I've done. And you'll just come across these random stories like, oh, like little Timmy, his life tragically cut short at eight years old because he was trampled by a donkey. His parents should have been watching more carefully while he was you know, working on the farm. Like that's not an uncommon thing to run across. Because this is, so I'm not trying to pretend like the 1800s, the 19th century was some kind of ideal time. Like, oh, let's go, you know, like frolic in the, Frolic in the field or whatever, we all get to go work in, in a factory. But the point is the relative point. So the value of an opportunity is always going to be defined by what your alternative options are. And when the alternative option is being stuck on the farm, never getting to meet someone, a life of the same work um, that your mother did her whole life and her grandmother did her whole life and you know, kind of back into eternity, this can seem pretty exciting. Um, so these women take home in four or five years work um, the equivalent of about $20,000 in contemporary purchasing power. So the kind of the, the life arc is that a woman goes to start this kind of work when she's between 16 to 18. She leaves 
around 22, 23, often gets married and settles down afterwards. We do that a lot in this country today, too. Actually, it's just we go to college instead of work. So go to college afterwards. You know, age of marriage is rising again, but you know, a lot of people kind of get settled down and start their lives in some way. Um, except the difference is today, you're lucky if you're only $20,000 in debt as opposed to actually taking home and having $20,000 in your bank account. So this is money that these women are using to put husbands and brothers through medical school or through law school um, to kind of um, allow them to maybe be a little bit more picky about who they would like to marry. It's not as pressing of an issue if you do have something um, that you can use to continue to support yourself. They buy their own apartments. They buy things like pianos, which is the, you know, the 1850s flat screen TV. Um, banks are opening just to service their accounts. So you know, remember the situation we're coming from where just a generation earlier, none of those kind of luxuries are available to women. And in fact, they're explicitly denied them. Um, OK, so how does all of this new opportunity translate into actual political change? So I already mentioned a little bit that these mills were um, really dependent on being able to attract women who would be able to perform this work for them. So one way that we can see how concerned they were and the lengths that they were willing to go to in order to attract female labor is that they would hire recruiters to travel around the countryside. This is mostly in the northeastern United States here we're still talking about. And they would go into a town. They'd put up an advertisement like this in the local paper. Um, 75 young women from 15 to 35 wanted to work in the cotton mills in Lowell. And Mr. Boynton here, he's going to show up at town hall. Everybody's welcome to come and to visit and to hear about the opportunity and learn more about it. Um, this is to overcome an educational barrier, since this kind of work and this idea of moving to the city for work is not common at this period of time. You have to convince people that it's a real opportunity. Um, and they get involved in this just vicious competition for who's going to be able to attract the young women in this period in time to be able to come to work in their factory. So you have these headhunters kind of cruising around, bringing people in um, like Orilla Varney and giving her their presentation as to why she should consider working in their mill. Um, so I'll just read Orilla's letter to her sister here briefly. Let anyone have told me three weeks before I came that I should ever work in a lull factory, I should have ridiculed the idea at once. But they're building new factories here and they sent out a man to get girls to work in them. He came to New York and picked up girls, at least 72 in number. They did not all come at the same time that I came. There were only 18 that came then, but they all came this spring. And who wonders if I did get the Lowell fever, but I do not regret that I came. So the Lowell fever was, would have been typhoid. Um, so early American cities had incredible sanitation problems um, in addition to the other difficulties they encountered. And here you have this young woman saying, even though I got typhoid, I am still glad that I came to be able to take advantage of this work opportunity. And why? She can make two or three people could have in the town that she came from, Peru, New York. Um, and she likes weaving. She's sick of teaching. She tried to be a teacher, which would have been, you know, in addition to domestic work, teaching would have been maybe one of the few things you could have done for a little bit as a young woman until you got married. Um, she could only get a dollar and a quarter. She's making two or three times as much now. So she says, I guess you and Harriet had better come to Lowell and get rich with the rest of the 16,000 girls here. This, this independence, this independence is being communicated by these women back to their families, back to their communities to advertise this opportunity. Winds up being one of the vehicles through which you start to change these ideas about what kinds of opportunities are going to be available to women. Um, but I just love Orilla. And there are so many stories like this that you can find um, in their journals, in the Lowell Offering, in Voices of Industry, which is another magazine 
that the women working in the mill create um, more in the 1850s than in the, the, um, the wool offerings mostly in the 1840s. But so this opportunity and how much these mills are willing to pay for the women to come work in their factories kind of set the stage then not only for this cultural change where women now do have significantly different lives that they can choose to embark on if they want to than they had access to before, but it also puts these economic and political leaders in a situation, which I'm gonna talk about going on into the next section, where they now need to pay a little bit more attention to what these women want. So if you are the political decision maker and women can't vote, women can't give you campaign contributions, you might not be particularly motivated to really take their interests into account. And this importance of women for economic production and the increased bargaining power that they now have is only one part of the story. The next part of the story, and my second uh, kind of hypothesis for why so much changed in the 19th century United States is that we lived in a really um, robustly competitive federal structure in the 19th century United States. Um, so this idea that there are different states that you can choose to go live in, that they're going to have different sets of laws around property and, um, and the rights of women within a marriage creates this situation in which you actually have political competition. So when we talk about theories of political competition today, um, one of the, there are a few contexts that you still hear about this in the United States. So um, there are a disproportionate number of American corporations headquartered in Delaware. Why is this? Because Delaware has some of the uh, laws that are friendliest to incorporation of any state in the country. And you are, as long as, you know, uh, I think you ha have to have some degree of presence there, but I don't think very much. Um, but incorporation law is one of those areas in law where you often have a choice, an easy choice that you can make between the law of different states. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, where you were born or where you currently live. Um, we think about this a lot in our daily lives in terms of like public school systems, uh, you know, other local public goods as well. But I think school systems is one of the most common where people really do actively think a lot, hmm, maybe I'd like to live in Arlington instead of Fairfax or vice versa because I like what's going on with the school in the neighborhood better. Um, so we see political competition still in some more circumscribed ways. Um, one of the reasons why we don't see it in as many areas of life as we did in the 19th century is that now so much is dictated at the federal level. So federal agencies and federal law are putting constraints on how different the laws in different states can possibly be. Um, so recently in, in the news, there's been um, talk about state laws reforming occupational choice. You know, that's another, or occupational licensing law rather. Um, that is one area where we can still get some degree of competition. Pot legalization was another recent move. But there are huge swaths within criminal justice, within tax, um, within you know, family and property law, where states can't really differentiate themselves anymore. It was almost all up for grabs in the 19th century. The federal government was teensy. It was pretty much just the military and the treasury at the beginning of the 19th century. And I think when the United States was founded, um, the federal government accounted for about 1% of governmental expenditure. Um, or, I'm sorry, they kind of, the federal government was about 1% of GDP. Now, of course, it's over 40% of GDP. Um, so kind of the uh, balance of power between federal and state government has really shifted in the United States. But it used to be the case that states held the bulk of the substantive power, um, which is why the, you know, the United States was considered a republic 
it wasn't you know, one government that had little subsidiaries, had a few things they could do. It was really about all these states being independent governing bodies and having just a few things that they did together, like a common currency and military. So that's really changed over the past 200 years. Um, but because there was still so much competition and so much that was up in the air, so many states, you know, kind of over this period of time I'm describing where women are gaining economic rights, the United States is also taking shape. Nobody knew in 1800 or even 1830 what all of the different states were going to be. Was the boundary of the United States going to extend all the way to the Pacific Ocean? They certainly did not know what the shape of those states were going to be, how large the, uh, you know, of territory they were going to cover. So this really is something that looks a lot more like a competitive market where you have this possibility for political entry and exit of different kind of governing bodies depending on how well they do. Um, we just don't have that kind of competitive discipline in, pol in the political sphere anymore. Um, okay, so this is just a very, you, you can think about this kind of in a very simple um, market exchange kind of model. And you can think about how competitive this political environment might be according to these kind of supply and demand conditions. So what kind of alternatives and, and choice are available on the demand side? Do you have women and families who are actually able to meaningfully make this choice and to move about the country? So that requires not just being politically allowed to do so, but there's also a technological aspect of it. You know, how possible, how feasible is it to actually move into this different territory? Is it safe? Is there a road to get there? Um, so this is all, these are all conditions that are changing over the 19th century. And jurisdictions also have to have autonomy in how they form their law. So I already talked about that, so I won't belabor it. But that's the two, sub two sides of our kind of exchange system here. Um, and in addition to the political choice, in addition to different political jurisdictions actually having that autonomy. And I'll talk in a little bit about some of, some more of the, the reasons why they felt the need to be so competitive. Um, it was possible for single women to choose to live in different jurisdictions. So if women didn't like the situation they were facing in Connecticut, they could choose to move to somewhere that had a better legal structure for them. Um, you could save up to get from New York to California on just a few months worth of salary from working in one of these mills. Um, of course, as the 19th century progresses, there are more industries and more different kinds of labor opportunities for women. But it is something that's affordable. Um, the frontier often has um, higher salaries to offer because there aren't as many people out there yet. Um, so you're not going to face as much competition for your labor services. Um, so again, we have this idea of another opportunity, another way to get away from the farm, and another way that women can substantively choose a different life. So we're talking again, still about this kind of expansion of alternatives that are available to them. In addition, over this period of time, the cost of getting out to a different state or territory is plummeting. So in 1800, if you started in New York City, it would take you, after the Panama Canal opens, it's possible to get to California in three months. Before that, you're looking at six to nine months because the only options available are the overland routes like you would have been playing in Oregon Trail. Um, the odds of winning, you know, we, California is a state now, so clearly the odds of winning were higher than they actually were in that video game, which to my knowledge, nobody ever actually made it to <laughs> California. Um, but it, so you're talking about six to nine months, you're talking about a substantial risk, you're talking about not earning during that period of time. It's a huge investment to settle. Um, by 1930, you can get from New York to several places in California in three days. 
And the real significant change when you go from three to six months to a week or two to get to California is when the transcontinental rail connects. It connects in Promontory City, Utah. There are rail companies building from the east and also from the west. They meet in the middle. And all of a sudden, you don't have to go by stagecoach. Uh, you can now go by train. And it's not, you know, people might complain about Amtrak today, but these early train rides were much worse. The cars were often open, so you were getting covered in, like, dirt and soot. There were not really places to stop along the way. There certainly wasn't, you know, plumbing in the car. Um, so, again, not an easy trip, but this opportunity to get across the country um, gives women this ability to choose to live somewhere different. So we not only had this economic opportunity, we now have this opportunity in terms of mobility, that there are alternatives in terms of where you'd like to live. Um, why would they go? And why is this important? So here you start to see the politicians getting involved. So if you, especially if we're talking about uh, the Western territories of the United States, these are not yet admitted to the United States of America. They're being run by what's called a territorial government. So when the territory is first claimed, this could be as few as four people. Uh, a governor, um, a, uh, an assistant governor, or whatever the right word for, lieutenant governor, or whatever, um, secretary, treasurer. These are the four people who are governing that territory. They're often ex-military. They're appointed by the United States, um, the federal government of the United States of America. So these are kind of crossover political military operatives. And their job is to try to bring that territory into the United States. So they're being politically appointed for a specific purpose to make sure that territory comes under the control of the United States government and to make sure um, you know, later on in his, later on, by the middle of the 19th century, we're, we're starting to get, um, you know, the battle between the, the slave and the non-slave holding states complicating this issue a little bit. But largely, whether or not a territory can join the United States is predicated on whether the population is large enough. So when Thomas Jefferson writes the Northwest Ordinance, which is the first major kind of <coughs> territorial governing document, he describes in there these specific population numbers you have to hit to be considered by Congress for admission. They use that as a template for all other territories that become, that, that are brought under United States control. They increase the population numbers a little bit as the 19th century goes on. But in effect, the situation you have is that you have this small number of individuals, these territorial governors, whose career prospects and whose job depend on them attracting population to that territory. So this is why um, they do things like publish advertisements about how great their territory is, that they circulate in newspapers around the country, and they say things like, this is, the, by the way, this is um, the governor of Montana, the territory of Montana, saying here in Montana there is remunerative labor, it's so hard not to say remunerative, remunerative labor for all. Montana is especially desirable for women. You have the governor of the territory of Colorado and Nevada, which was combined at the time, saying it would be a great blessing if an emigration of females to Colorado and Nevada could be obtained. So you get this group that was considered politically an underclass that couldn't even go to court for themselves, and now they are the target of a major political PR campaign where you have these territorial governors who are working to create the law for that territory, to increase its population, and to bring it into the United States. And one of their main targets this is to try to make their territory appealing to women. Um, one of the reasons why women become particularly um, important rather than just population in general is that frontiers are usually initially settled by men. So the first census in Denver 
is 95% male. It's pretty hard to build a robust society with 95% men. Um, so it's very important along these frontier reaches to try to convince some women to move out. This is not only for, you know, like relationship and family formation reasons, which is critically important, um, but also because women are seen as like civilizing, like it's not a real society until you have women there as well. And there are a lot of important services that are primarily, you know, run, operated by women along the frontiers, things like laundries, things like um, inns, boarding houses, things like that. And these are the opportunities that they're encouraging women to, to move out and to take advantage of in these territories. Um, there are several other of these that are explicitly made by people I know to be governors or you know, political officials. There are hundreds more that I have no idea who wrote them, um, but they're all over the newspapers. So, just, you know, just in the time that I was doing this archival research, I found hundreds of these. And they say things like, go west, young girl. In Texas, they're paying servant girls $20 a month. Field County, California has 1,100 unmarried men and 28 unmarried women. Go west, girls. So they were aware of that kind of population disparity I was mentioning as well. Um, and this is my favorite one just because of the sheer drama of it. For humanity's sake, and a mutual benefit to the race and to both sections of the country, do Mr. Editor earnestly recommend the emigration from down east of a few thousand virtuous and industrious young ladies to this section of the union. So, you know, women are opening these newspapers. This one about the, the glamour of Utah um, was published in New York City. Um, this one about California being published in Chicago. This one in Texas is being published in Cleveland and read in Cleveland. So this is information that's getting around the country. Women do have access to this information about the different kinds of wages and job opportunities and life opportunities that are going to be available to them along the territories. Um, the Homestead Act begins to allow even single women to claim homesteaded property in their own name. So you have um, this great relaxation of both legal tradition um, and the way that these, that family is kind of thought of and the way that women are being treated by the political system coming out of this structure that was, I don't know if you want to think about it as just being um, this unique moment in time, even if the particular way it came about in the United States experience is unique, there are many ways to go about incorporating elements of political competition in a modern society. All you have to do is make it easier to choose, easier to move. Um, so even if this particular historical example was unique, this idea of peeping, people being able to choose how they would like to be governed, it really happened in history and it really mattered to a group who was a minority, who was currently underrepresented in the political system, being able to get the power they needed for change to occur. All right, um, this one's shorter, so don't worry. Um, but my third kind of argument or idea that I wanna share with you um, that I think really mattered in the United States experience to this legal system changing is the ideological component. So this idea that even if you have these political incentives in place for leaders to be more accountable to the population, even if you have expanding opportunity, you have all these ingredients, but if people don't actually want a more egalitarian society, incentives to be responsive to the people won't bring you a more egalitarian society. The whole idea of these compatible incentive structures that encourage politicians to take account of what people want and what people value is that it's gonna give the people what they want. So what if they want something um, that looks different, that continues to exclude women from making their own economic decisions? Um, the fact that really critical people believe that this is something women would value 
mattered for this change being able to happen. Okay, so we know politicians believed it. This is, you know, I already shared a couple examples of this kind of quote, but here's yet another territorial governor saying there are many things that we have to do to secure immigration. I know that we have to be liberal in politics and religion and in social matters. So he's recognizing this need to form their government and their society in a way that's going to be responsive to the people. Um, this is Susan B. Anthony. I have her um, pictured here with her parents, Daniel and Lucy Anthony. And the reason for that is that uh, Anthony had a lot of childhood experiences that really shaped her values and her principles and put her in the position to wind up being so successful doing the work that she did through the, the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century with reforming women's property law, with being considered one of the critical figures that brought about women's suffrage, um, advocating for women on, on all kinds of margins, including like the treatment of women in the household. So she also advocated against um, you know, domestic abuse, things like that. So she really was um, this kind of feminist visionary. Her parents, Daniel and Lucy, owned one of the textile mills that I described kind of in the first part of this presentation. It was a smaller one. It wasn't nearly as large as the one in Lowell. But Daniel Anthony wanted to break into that industry and he owned, at different points in time, two different mills, both in Pennsylvania. But the thing that's important about that is that Susan was there, and she was watching these women work and earn. And she, was, um, she wanted initially to be a lawyer and was told that she couldn't because women weren't allowed to go to law school. So it created this cognitive dissonance for her. I'm seeing this women do all this work and make all these decisions for themselves, but yet I'm being told that I'm not allowed to do X, Y, and Z just because of my gender. She had seen the capability of these women, so it just didn't make sense to her why there would ever be logic behind a system that would deny women the ability to make their own decisions in this way. Um, another important connection is that um, Daniel Anthony was an active abolitionist. So he was involved in, with several different Quaker organizations. Um, he got kicked out of one because he allowed the, the uh, teenagers in the community to come have a dance at his house because he didn't want them to dance at the bar. He wanted to protect them from the alcohol, but the dancing was bad too. So he got kicked out of the Quaker. You know, you know, he joined another one. Um, so he actually wound up um, working with Frederick Douglass, if that's uh, from, so a very... Um, a former slave, uh, you know, free black who was considered um, one of the most impactful orators on behalf of, um, you know, the free black population and their rights in this period of time. Um, so she had the, in addition to this idea that women were fully capable, she also had this idea that, like, change was possible, reform was possible, and it was important to try to do the right thing. Um, and then here's, I saved the most, I'm not saying Susan B. Anthony wasn't important, she's incredibly important, but I think this is the most important one. So the fact that the women themselves, just the women who are working in these factories, working on these farms, your kind of everyday daughters, wives, and mothers, the fact that they believed that their economic rights were important, I think was probably more critical than anything else. So this is another quote from the Lowell Offering. So this is a, a mill woman writing this piece. Um, they call them, at that time, they called themselves the mill girls. And so most of the historical literature called them the mill girls. And then one time I had um, a grad student say to me, why are you calling them girls? That's so offensive. These are adult women. And I thought, you know, just because history called them that doesn't mean I have to, too. We you know, revise the language of history all the time. So but I, I take that very seriously. So these women have an indefeasible and inalienable right to buy and sell, solicit and refuse, choose and reject us of men. These propositions we are prepared to defend, and while we have mind, talent, acquisition, ability, and a pen, we will defend them. So this recognition of the fact that there were decisions that were being denied to them, that were critically important to them being able to make decisions within their lives, 
so she's recognizing that this go that buying and selling is part of this, but it's only part of it. So it's also about choosing and rejecting different options in life. It really, at the end of the day, is about that question I started with. Do you get to plan your life? Are you the architect or the author, whichever analogy you prefer, of your own life? Or are you just doing a fill in the blanks? And somebody else is really putting most of the words on the page. Um, and so this idea that there were important decisions that were being denied to them, that it was important to fight against, this was an ideology that was increasingly understood by women in general over the course of the 19th century. And ideas were an important part of that. And one of the reasons I really wanted to emphasize that today is that I know this idea that ideas are important is very critical to the mission here at IHS. And so you know, without this kind of understanding of an ideology of liberalism and equality, I am not sure that all of these economic and political incentives that I described in the first half of the talk uh, would have been able to do much at all for women. Okay. Um, a brief digression into something a tiny bit less, not, not a digression, but uh, uh, not for something different um, in Monty Python speak. Um, however, institutional change is rarely linear. It's not unanimously agreed on. And of course, as you can imagine, you know, I've told a very optimistic story so far. There are going to be some bumps in the road. And so one of the really kind of moments of backlash, maybe, against this expansion of rights for women um, came about in the, particularly in the early progressive era, when women became um, kind of something of a pawn in this debate over the appropriate role for labor and capital. So here, this is, kind, this is uh, Mary Van Cleek. This is actually a picture of Mary. Um, and she was, you know, women by the early 19th century, more and more of them had received an advanced education. There's more of what we'd call now a middle class, people who have some leisure time to be able to do things like agitate for change. Um, and many of these women who were very heavily involved in the social reform movement in the late 19th, early 20th century, they were very um, kind of moved by uh, the socialist program. This idea that there was, and, you know, and I, I have a lot of empathy for this, especially um, coming from the women having lived in a situation in which they were so clearly being treated unfairly um, by many of the major systems in the world. You know, they're looking for an alternative. And many of them come to focus on this idea that it's the conflict between labor and capital, that it's the, you know, it's business that is taking advantage of them, um, which of course is a common, I guess, pitfall. We interact so directly and so frequently with business. So much of what government does is kind of unseen. This is why studying the economics and politics and going to your IHS summer seminar and coming to GMU to study econ is so important. Being able to understand those things that are less obvious. Um, but this idea, this idea that, the, that there's something that's really screwed up here going on in employment, um, winds up translating pretty directly into some political changes that are negative for women. Um, so this idea that they're going to now need to modify supply and demand and modify some of these relationships winds up taking the form of a political reform movement that is focused on working conditions. They actually, you know, since I'm, they're focused on this conflict between, you know, labor and the industrialists kind of in general writ large. So many of these reformers would have preferred these reforms to apply to everybody. They did not initially intend to target women. Um, but the courts strike down initially interference in the employment relationship between men and their employers. But the courts wind up becoming 
much more sympathetic to this idea that women might need protecting. So we're uncomfortable and interfering between the voluntary choices of, of men and an employer, but they make this public um, interest case with respect to women. So women are the mothers within our society. It's important for them to be healthy. The state actually has an interest in encouraging motherhood and encouraging healthy mothers. So what they do is they marshal a bunch of early kind of pseudoscientific evidence. Like they do surveys where they have people stand out the factory, outside the factory, and when, when women are exiting, they'll ask them, um, you know, do you have health problems? Are you tired at the end of the day? I just finished a 10 hour shift, of course I'm tired. Um, but they publish this survey data and they present it to the courts and the courts accept this claim that doing this kind of work for too long or in the wrong conditions is harming women and in doing so they're harming the very future of the United States, our ability to continue to be a society. The background to all of this is fear that immigration is going to be the downfall of the United States. This is 1890s, 1900s. Um, you know, much like today, there are there were large, I mean, larger than there were large waves of immigration, proportionally larger. There were large waves of immigration. There was this fear um, that people who were not white were just not going to be as good and as valuable to the union as people who were white. So this is the heyday of scientific racism. And this background, this idea that if white women are not having enough children, we will wind up substantively harming ourselves and, and basically bringing ourselves down from the inside, unfortunately gets some political traction. So it winds up working against immigrants. It also winds up working against women. And um, we see that all but six states by 1918 have decided to limit working hours, but just for women. So through the 19th century, we've had all these expansions in women's ability to make their own economic decisions. And now in the early 1900s, we're starting to say, okay, well, you can participate in the economy, but not on the same terms as men. You can participate, but you have to leave after eight hours or you have to, they, another change they really want is for women to be prohibited from working at night. So they're agitating for um, women to not be allowed to work after a certain hour in the evening. Um, this is a really severe disability, especially if you are in a family that needs two incomes to be able to survive. When else are you going to work? You know, your husband is working during the day, you probably have to be at home caring for the children. And there are actually specific, there's one specific case that I can think of off the top of my head um, where they say, oh, well, you know, I can't remember the name, I'm making up the name. Mary got fired because of your new law. Don't you think that's terrible? And the response is, no, she should be home with her children. What was she out doing working? That wasn't the right, that, that was not the right thing like for her or for the public. So we had this interference now in women being able to choose how they would like to spend their time, what they think is the best way for them to spend their time and their energy. Um, so this is, and, and some courts do recognize this as being counter to the spirit of the Married Women's Property Acts and the other legislation that expanded women's economic rights. But nonetheless, it, it uh, winds up prevailing. Um, it's overtaken by New Deal reforms that wind up extending a lot of these protections to the entire population which is why the gendered component of many of them go away over time. But it actually wasn't unconstitutional to discriminate based on gender in the law until the 1970s. This is not ancient history. This is not that long ago. You know, this is our mothers and our grandmothers who lived in situations in which their ability to work and their incentive to work and to develop the skills to be able to productively do this kind of labor outside the household was being directly constrained by law. Um, so this is a, a severe kind of limitation and, and this is one of the pieces of history that explains for me why we still do see so much uh, 
variation in the opportunities and the choices that women make in the labor market. So we have largely voluntary opportunity now. There are a few ways in which you're actually forcibly constrained, but there still are a lot of patterns of careers that women just don't go into very, you know, very substantially or, or, or men don't go into in significant numbers. Um, and it takes a long time for patterns like this to change. Um, so understanding this history of the fact that we did put these explicit barriers in place. Of course, motherhood and childbirth is still an important part of that story as well. But I think claiming that motherhood is the only thing driving these choices when this history is so recent seems a little far-fetched to me. OK, so how can we think about the legacy, the impact of this political legacy on women's lives today? Um, Although reform in the United States has been quite effective, the same cannot be said for every region in the globe. Um, so this is a, a chart that shows uh, restrictions on women's employment in different regions around the world. So the way to read this chart is like if we look here at South Asia, 50% of the countries in South Asia prohibit women from working in jobs deemed hazardous or morally inappropriate. 63% of countries in South Asia prohibit, have some prohibitions on industrial work, and 63% have some prohibitions on night hours. The same is true for the Middle East, where we have significant still prohibitions on women's ability to enter into particular occupations or in particular ways, also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some of the reform that has happened, so you might say like, oh, you know, oh, so that means that, you know, 40 plus percent of countries in South Asia don't have any restrictions or, you know, 40 percent in the Middle East. That may be true or it may not be true um, because a lot of the reform that has happened has been uh, kind of motivated by the fact that aid of international organizations is often, if not limited, these governments are kind of pressured into making changes that do not specifically, um, you know, bias against women or bias against particular races. So the question of whether that actually is a cultural and social change coming along with that legal change, there is in some cases and there is not in others. So it's a little complicated. Um, over a third of countries restrict women's Many of that, uh, many of those restrictions are in the form of passport controls, countries where you have to get your husband's permission to get a passport. Um, over half of countries prohibit women from working in specific jobs. And in 18 countries, husbands are legally permitted to prohibit their wives from working at all. You need husband's permission to, and, and this is, um, this doesn't even touch on countries that prohibit women from owning bank accounts or prohibit um, women from being without male chaperone in public and, you know, all other um, kinds of restrictions. In addition to being a human rights issue, this is also an economic growth issue, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so this is a report by the International Monetary Fund. They estimate that there are 40 countries who sacrifice between 15 and 30 percent of their GDP by excluding women from the workforce. So this is often coming at a significant cost to the country as a whole. So I, there's room for a lot of research to be done here on what exactly are the political dynamics then that are preventing this change from taking place given that it would be in the interest of this population. You know, especially if you have, many of these are, um, like there are Middle Eastern um, oil producing nations topping this list you know, Qatar, Iran, the Emirates. These are situations where maybe even if the population as a whole would benefit, it might not matter at all to the ruling uh, group in that society. So you can get those kind of factors that lead to such a significant um, increase in poverty for people who have to live in these situations across the world. Um, so, Hopefully this is not a super shocking set of kind of implications um, after that presentation. 
But when we think about these women who still are facing these restrictions on their ability to make their own economic decisions and wondering how to improve their situation, I think we can borrow from the American experience. Access to economic opportunity is important. One of the main ways that economic opportunity can increase in developing nations is if we freely trade with them. Is it okay or is it not okay to build a factory in Bangladesh? And I picked kind of a controversial example on purpose because there are you know, concerns often of should we be you know, um, putting economic sanctions against countries that don't treat their people well, if um, you know, labor standards aren't up to snuff in these different industries in different parts of the world, does that mean we should not be supporting them? Well, maybe, but you probably are limiting uh, options for women in those countries when you do so. Um, making it easier to cross borders, again, it's that ability to exit that's gonna be your protection not only in individual relationships, but also from an oppressive set of laws in your country. And that ideological point that remembering that economic rights are not counter to human rights. So when we make arguments about needing to protect people from corporations, things like that, what we're often doing is hindering their human rights and their ability to make economic decisions without really recognizing it or thinking about it in that way. So if we, in the name of human rights and advancement, wind up cutting off these opportunities, we do a disservice to these women. And so making, doing the work to educate on that margin um, is something that really can make a meaningful difference and can change the, you know, the, the fortunes of women around the globe. Um, thank you. <laughs>